Thank you. And uh, just to clarify, um, right, this is being recorded, so that's good. And that um, when someone wants to interrupt, they can just uh, unmute themselves or they'll put up their hands and then you will unmute them. Yes, because it's an interactive workshop. So anyone who has a questions or would like to ask Dr. Nassim about it, just raise your hand and from here we will unmute you. So then you can uh, put on your videos and your mics to ask questions. And the way they would uh, raise their hand is if they click on participants, uh, yeah, they the can. Participants there, uh, they choose on your more, there is the options to raise your hand. So from there, we notice that you, you wanted to ask the questions and so on, we will unmute you from there. Okay. Okay. And also, just to clarify, yes, under invite, mute all, or uh, raise hands. Okay. Okay. So there is a raise hand function. Okay, that's good. And uh, you have added me as a uh, co-host. Let me just check on the polls. Yes, as that co-host, you can unmute the participants as well. Okay, yeah. And uh, at the moment, we've got the true, false, yes, no question. But there isn't the three added later. You'll add that later. Yep. I'll, add, I'll add them on uh, in a while. Okay, all right. That's so I'll good. stop and share my screen right here, and then you can carry on. Okay. Okay. And I'll share a couple of documents. Um, okay. Okay, right. It's five past uh, seven in, in New Zealand at the moment, and it's uh, five past five, oh, sorry, five past three in the afternoon in Malaysia, and five past eight in the UK, and all the other countries in between the UK and uh, New Zealand. Uh, Welcome all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Nassim. I'm uh, gonna share with you some, um, some uh, interesting things about subcontracts. Now, before I actually start looking, jumping straight into the contract itself and looking at the clauses, I just wanna clarify a few things. Last Saturday, we had a session, but that session was focused only on Malaysia. Uh, but this time it's open to the whole world, really. So I'm gonna share with you um, a set of subcontract uh, terms of contract which um, can be used anywhere in the world so but before i do that just to make sure that we are all on the same page uh, by same page i mean we're all speaking the same language because there could be uh, differences uh, uh, in different jurisdictions uh, just to clarify there is a there may be a client uh, who is a client? The client in some countries, they call it uh, employer. In Malaysia and the UK, they tend to be called employer. Uh, others call it uh, principal. In New Zealand, we call it principal and so on. So whatever it is, it, we're referring to the client. So that's one party. The client typically in a construction project has got a contract with the um, main contractor. In some countries, they call it the head contractor, main contractor, or just contractor. So between the client, and the main contractor or a head contractor, uh, there is a contract. Now that contract is, uh, there, there are many, many standard forms of uh, main contracts published around the world. In the UK, the most famous one is of course the JCT, there's the NAC contract, there is the um, uh, GC Works one, the government contract in the UK. Um, in Singapore, you have the SIA, Singapore Internet, uh, Institute of Architects contract. In Malaysia, we have the JKR or the Public Works Department contract. We have the um, uh, Pertubuhan Architect Malaysia, the Architects contract, PAM contract as it's normally referred to. And uh, we've got uh, the Institution of Engineers contract, IEM contract, and lots of other contracts. Uh, in Australia, AS4000 as it's called is the equivalent of the main contract. And in New Zealand, typically the most commonly used one is called the um, uh, NZS 3910, New Zealand Standards 3910 2013 edition currently. In South Africa, we've got the JBCC series of contracts. So those are all main contracts. Main contracts are between the client and the contractor, the main contractor. Today's session is about subcontracts for every main contract you're likely to have lots more many more subcontracts the subcontract is entered into between the contractor the main contractor 
and the subcontractors. Typically, there will be many. There could be 5, 10, 50 or more. So that subcontract, uh, I just want to make sure that we're all getting the terminology correct. Maybe of two kinds, uh, simplistically, just keep it to two for now. Uh, there are others, but we'll keep the basics. And one of it is um, nominated subcontractors. Now, by nominated subcontractors, we mean the subcontractor is selected by the client or the contract administrator, whoever it is that's administering the main contract. So that's one type of subcontractors, nominated subcontractors. Now, the other type generally around the world are called domestic subcontractors. Who are domestic subcontractors? Domestic subcontractors are contractors uh, who the main contractor themselves uh, select. So if a main contractor, the head contractor themselves, select a particular subcontractor, that is generally referred to as a domestic subcontractor. And by domestic, we do not mean uh, domestic meaning in domestic in New Zealand means New Zealand. Domestic in Malaysia means a, a Malaysian con subcontractor and so on. No, we don't mean that. By domestic, um, if you look at most textbooks around the world, particularly published in the UK, the domestic subcontractor refers to a subcontractor who is selected by the main contractor. So that's what we mean by domestic subcontractor. Now, just for the record, uh, today's session is entirely about uh, the uh, domestic subcontract. Okay, And uh, last week on the 13th of June, we had a session where a, a standard form of uh, construction contract, a subcontract published in Malaysia. Here is the colorful version of it. Mm, you can't see it. And it doesn't matter. Anyway, I'll just... Um, uh, I'll just... Uh, Right, anyway, uh, you, you can see it anyway. And the, the, the plain version of it without the color is what you see in the shared screen. So you can see the screen share, you can see a PDF of the document. Now it's called the model terms of construction contract between a contractor and a subcontractor for subcontract works. This was published in 2007 by the Construction Industry Contracts Committee in Malaysia. And uh, it was first published in 2006, uh, in, in September, and then in uh, 2007, in May, there was a slightly um, um, revised version, just a minor uh, modification. Officially, it was published by the Construction Industry Development Board in Malaysia, and, um, and it is a domestic subcontract. There was a committee that dealt with it, um, uh, comprising... Uh, a range of people, and these are the committee members. It includes uh, engineers, quantity surveyors, architects, uh, uh, a lawyer or two, um, and people from the construction uh, contracts background uh, and uh, contractor background, as well as um, engineering and uh, uh, developers, you know, background by developers. And it was endorsed by a whole bunch of uh, organization in Malaysia. And this particular contract, I want to share with you how this contract was written. Remember, this is in 2007. Okay, this is in 2007. Right. The... Um, the subcontract itself was published in uh, 2007, as I said, and it had a structure which had three parts. Part A, which is basically the agreement and definitions. Part B, which is basically the terms of the contract. And part C, which is the appendix, where you fill in the blanks. Now, it's important to appreciate this was written in 2007. Three parts, agreement, which basically talks about who are the parties to the contract, who is a contract administrator, who is a client, overall project, but it keeps referring to part C, where you fill in the blanks, okay? For instance, in part uh, A, it says date for starting the work and refers to part C8, uh, or rather item C8, where it will state, you fill in the blanks, 
what date it is. Okay, so there's part A, part B, the terms of uh, main terms, and part C, where you fill in the blanks. Okay, that was the structure of it. Uh, again, this is the part B. You can see part B is all the terms, and I'll just jump straight to part C, where you can see where you fill in the blanks. Date of this contract, you fill in. Signature, um, other details like, um, yeah, the um, date for starting the works, date for completing the works, how much it is, and so on. Okay, so there's parts A, B, and C. Now, this particular contract, as I said, was written in 2007. Okay, things have moved on. I have since uh, effective um, today, actually, just up to close to seven o'clock uh, New Zealand time, come up with a modified version, a better version than this particular uh, contract. And I am going to share with you uh, this modified version in a Word document, just so that we can see how things have evolved between 2007 and 13 years later, a slightly amended version. It's very similar, but it's only got two parts. Okay, it's only got two parts. Now, um, before, be, uh, let me just, uh, just get the, the right. Let me just uh, because what I've shared with you is the main contract. What I need it's is I need to share the subcontract. Let me just open that. Uh, right. Okay. Now, let me share with you the subcontract. Uh, right, okay, here we go. Right, this is uh, the subcontract, which unlike earlier, where we had part A, B, and C, this particular one has only got part A and part B. So it's, it's different. Okay, now part A is where instead of the parties and then you refer to part C and fill in the blanks, straight away in part A, you fill in the blanks. Any, like for instance, the date for starting the work and everything else. Okay, um, and part B are basically the terms of a contract. So it's even simpler. Okay, now this will probably form the basis of a second edition of the model terms of subcontract which has been published before. But this is a beta version, and I'm gonna run through this to demonstrate to you how this contract could potentially be used, not only in Malaysia, but also anywhere in the world with minimal, possibly very, um, no modification at all. So I'm just, I'm just gonna run through this whole contract, and uh, as I wanted to, I want this to be an interactive session. At any time, if you have any questions, please put up your hand in the uh, chat function and the mo tech moderator will unmute you. Just ask me the question. Or if you prefer, you can actually uh, just type your questions in the chat function and I will keep uh, looking uh, out for any questions. So far, um, I see that people have uh, generally signed in, including someone from Nigeria. Welcome, Richard. Um, and uh, feel free to interrupt me because I want this to be an interactive session. Uh, I want to handle the issues progressively. We've got about two hours and I want to finish everything, including dealing with your questions. Okay, so let's start from the basics. So I repeat, this is a subcontract, okay? It can be used with any main contract, whether it's JCT, FIDIC, uh, PAM, IEM, JKR, AS, uh, 4000, NZS3910, uh, JBCC, main contract, any contract, anywhere in the world. That's the target. This is a beta version, a testing version, to see whether this contract can work with any main contract in the world. So it is not, uh, tied into any one particular main contract. 
Okay, so that's the plan. That's the target. So here it says standard terms of construction, subcontract. And who is this between? A contractor. I've just put in a name just to demonstrate. Okay, so it's L2 Contractor Limited. And then um, the, the subcontractor's name. Just fill in the name. And short title of the work for the construction project. Okay, at the project site, wherever the project site is. So it doesn't matter. You can fill in whatever you want. It's just now part A basically has got the definitions and you're filling in the specifics, um, the, the, the uh, variable, the contract data, if you want. I think some contracts call it contract data. We don't call it. We just call it the agreement and the, the, the specifics of the um, contract provisions, the date, the price, the defects, liability period, the, the time frame within which uh, payment must be uh, made and so on. Okay. And then part B basically are the terms of the contract. At this point, using the, um, using the actual uh, contents page itself, I want to demonstrate how easy it is for this contract to be used for any subcontract. Whether that subcontract is for a little bit of painting works or that subcontract is for a, a $20 million or ringgit um, uh, piling work subcontract. Okay, so whether it's a small, minor painting works or it's a major subcontract for millions or tens of millions of ringgit or dollars, it can be used. Let's have a look. The structure of the contract, of the subcontract, is basically covered within these seven clauses. Now, why seven? You will notice that whilst it is just seven clauses, each of the clauses has got subclauses and subheadings and so on. So it covers everything. We will talk about, we'll, we'll, I'm open for discussion to see whether we've missed anything. Uh, maybe advance payment should be included. Maybe a retention sum should be included. Maybe performance bond should be included. So lots of things that could be included. Okay. So, but this is a base, seven clauses. The structure of it is this. Now, no one in the world would have seen this particular draft of the contract yet. No one, not even my family, because I only finished drafting this a few minutes before we started. So no one in the world has seen it. Therefore, I can actually test it out on you, the audience who are seeing it for the first time. Look at the structure of the contract. There are only seven clauses. Now, apparently, research shows when you have three, four, five, six, up to seven items to remember, the chances are you will remember it. But if you've got 15, 16, 17, 40, 70 things to remember or clauses to remember, the chances are uh, you won't remember all of them. So the test is this. How can you remember all the seven clauses within three minutes, for instance? I can have a look at the clock and start the time from now. Okay, Seven clauses. The first clause, the general obligation, the contract administration, and the definitions. Okay, so that's it. So it's general obligation, contract administration. So that's clause number one. Second clause is if you adopt the project management approach, what is it? All the time clauses access to the uh, project site, program, uh, suspension, uh, extension of time, completion, non completion. There you go, time. So number one, general obligation, contract administration. Number two, all the time clauses. Number three is money, time, cost, quality, remember? So number three is all the financial clauses, price for the work, insurance, indemnities, um, uh, payments, advance payment, uh, uh, final accounts, uh, retention sums. There you go. So clause number one, general obligation, contract administration. Number two is all the time clauses. Number three is all the money clauses. Three clauses so far out of seven. Number four, all the quality clauses, including the defects liability period. There you go. So that's four out of seven. Surely everyone can remember. General obligation, contract administration, time, cost, quality. That's the four clauses. Clause number five is about total sub or wholly subcontracting to others. Or as a subcontractor, it's possible that the subcontractor will sub sub the, the, the works. So that's a clause on um, sub subcontracting or subcontracting from the subcontractor to the sub subcontractor. And the last two basically termination and dispute resolution. So that structure 
general obligation contract administration, number one. Number two, time. Number three, clause number three is all the financials. Number four is all the quality. Five is subcontracting. Six is termination. Seven is dispute resolution. And I took under two minutes to do that. Under two minutes. I don't know about you, but all the subcontracts that you have ever been working on anywhere in the world, I'm not sure if you still remember all the clauses in the contract, in the subcontract that you think you're familiar, whether you're familiar with it, you know, there might be eight clauses, 15 clauses, 40 clauses, whatever. I think that most people can't really remember, whereas this structure helps you remember. My suggestion or my appeal to the construction industry is this. I hope that um, you will uh, think about rewriting whatever subcontract that you're using at the moment anywhere in the world to restructure that into this sort of a logical structure where you group the time clauses together, you group all the financial clauses together, quality clause together. Of course, in the beginning, you have to have the general obligation and, and the, the contract administration and so on, right? Okay, and then uh, uh, the, the subcontracting uh, provisions and then a termination and dispute resolution. Think about it. If you were to redraft all your contracts, Adopting this structure, I'm not talking about the words, structure, it will do industry good because then everybody will be able to administer and understand and get the structure uh, quicker. Okay, and it'll be easier for people to understand it. Now let's look at section A. What is section A or what is part A? Part A basically is agreement definitions and specific provisions. Now, what is it that you have to fill? I'm going to run through the entire contract to, to, to sort of demonstrate to you how easy it is for you to administer this contract, okay? this subcontract, parties to this contract, contractor, it says. Just fill in the name, address, telephone, fax, email, done. Subcontractor, fill in the name, correspondence address, telephone, fax, email. The contract administrator, who is the contract administrator? Uh, I'll explain that in a minute. But generally, when you fill this in, you basically put the name of the contract administrator, correspondence address, telephone fax, email, and so on. Okay. So basically, those are the parties to the contract. All you have to do is just fill in the blanks. Now, at the moment, I'm using a Word document, so you can easily fill in. Okay. Uh, if once this is done, if it it's done in the format of a fillable PDF, then you know you can actually have boxes where you just fill in wherever it is, okay, and so on. So that would be the plan once this is eventually published as a standard form of contract. This is, as I said, a beta draft in Word document. Now, I want to very quickly uh, explain this. Any subcontract, I repeat, any subcontract needs to be administered. Any main contract needs to be administered. In the main contract, the administrator might be called a contract administrator, engineer, architect, superintendent, superintending officer, or yeah, I think generally around the world, that's what they, they call it. Or project manager, possibly even project manager. Yeah, okay. Now, Whatever it is, the function of that person who is administering the contract is basically as a contract administrator. So in this contract, I have chosen to use the phrase contract administrator. So what is the contract administrator? Or who is the contract administrator? The person who administers the contract. In FIDIC, you call it engineer in the main contract. In the subcontract of the NSC uh, or sub, uh, nominated subcontracts and so on, you might give them all sorts of names. But here, I decided rather than calling them engineer, architect, and so on, you know, to keep it flexible, we just call them contract administrator. Now, I noticed this, the, the, the most commonly used construction contract in the UK, more than 70% usage, the JCT contract, used to be historically called, uh, the, the contract ministry used to be called architect, 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 like in Malaysia, architect, 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 like in Hong Kong, architect, 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 like in Singapore, architect, and so on. Because generally in these jurisdictions, the architect is the one who uh, is the primary person administering the contract. Now, I noticed in the UK, in JCT, they have now called it contract administrator stroke 
architect, contract administrator, stroke architect. So they are starting to realize it doesn't make sense to call the person who's administering the contract architect when it could be the engineer or some of the works could be delegated to somebody else. So why call them the architect? In some countries, the architect is a name preserved to only some people. So it's best not to call them architect, engineer, or whatever. Just call them contract administrator. If you want an architect to administer the contract, sure, name the person, whatever it is that the person is. You know, the architect is the one who's administering it. Name, the, name them here. So it can be an architect, it can be an engineer, it can be an architect. Okay? So that's the rationale behind using the terminology. By the way, I stand by every comma in the published model terms of subcontract 2007. And this one is a beta version of it. Of course, I stand by every comma, every word, every sentence in it, right? Um, and I'm, I'm looking at refining this until it becomes generic enough for it to be used anywhere in the world. Okay, next thing. Now, this is a domestic subcontract. It is a subcontract which can be used across any type of uh, work. And the whole contract comprises, the contract documents that is, comprises these terms, of course, yeah? Like in this case, I've identified there. If any of the following, they form part of the contract. What are they? Standard terms, which is a part A, and part B, which is a uh, standard terms of contract. Part A is a specific terms, okay? So those form part of the contract. Other things, other documents that could form the contract might be contractor's requirements. It could be, for instance, break down the scope of works and prices. It could be, for instance, bills or schedule of quantities. I will probably be dropping the word schedule of quantities because the whole world calls it bills of quantities. But in New Zealand, it's generally referred to as schedule of quantities. But now, with the standardizing of the Australian New Zealand standard of method of measurement, uh, we're going to drop it and everybody's going to call it bills of quantities around the world. So I'm going to drop possibly the word schedule of quantities, except for some historical reasons. Okay. Uh, or you could have a schedule of rates, rationalized by the contract administrator. You could have drawings, you could have specification, you could have subcontractors proposal and other documents that you might want to insert here. Other documents could be, for instance, maybe payment is going to be on milestone or stage payment. You attach the stage payment document here. Attached stage payment, uh, breakdown of stage payment. There you go. So those are the documents that form uh, the contract. Note. The program does not form part of the contract document. There is a clause where the contractor must submit, the subcontractor must submit a program. Yeah, that's okay. But it doesn't form part of the contract documents because um, if it does, then every one of the hundreds of activities in the, uh, which forms part of the contract, assuming the program does form part of the contract, there will be a breach. So we don't want that. So we just remove that and it just basically the, uh, uh, a requirement for the subcontractor to produce a program, but it doesn't form part of the contract document. Okay, now the scope of the works is all there and it refers to the project scope undertaken between the contractor and the client. And then of course the subcontract work, which is basically the scope of works in, in here. Now, now, this is interesting. Price for the work, okay? This is, um, I'm, I'm attempting now to use uh, the price for uh, trying to identify how do you establish the currency and what is the price for the work? Now, in the session that we had last week, that was a standard form of domestic subcontract published in Malaysia. The currency shown was uh, Ringgit Malaysia, Malaysian Ringgit, because that's specifically for Malaysia. This is an attempt by me to make it more of international use, including in Malaysia. So what I thought might be a good idea is to have the flexibility. It just says price for the work. And here you can actually state the currency. Okay. Uh, you state the currency and you state the amount, how much it is and so on. Now, in this case, I have intentionally put New Zealand dollars because I want to demonstrate that from Malaysia, Suddenly, you could put USD, you could put New Zealand dollars, Chinese renminbi, or whatever, any other currency for that matter. Um, Singapore dollars and uh, you, uh, British pounds or euros or whatever, okay? So this is just to demonstrate that I could put whatever. 
what I could do is I can just leave this blank and just say state the currency. I could literally just say state um, the currency. And then it says here, if not stated, currency where the project is. So if for some reason somebody didn't say, oh, which country, you know, uh, is this ringgit or New Zealand dollars or whatever. Uh, if somebody doesn't say it, fine, because it automatically uh, uh, goes back to the currency where the project is. Okay. So for instance, if somebody were to use this project in South Africa, it would be the South African currency. If it's used in Namibia, it would be the Namibia or Nigerian currency, wherever it is that's being used. So that immediately becomes extremely flexible. So you don't have to do any editing to this document. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm tempted to, um, to just leave it as it is, you know, state the currency. If not stated, currency where the project is. There you go. Okay, likewise, uh, this one. Delete the NZD, or New Zealand dollars, um, and just say state, uh, um, or, or just leave it as that, because from then on, all currency stated throughout the contract is a currency stated here. So once you state this currency, the rest of the document, it will mean whenever you see a, a price for works or, or whatever, it will automatically mean the currency stated here. Okay, right. Now, the next thing I want to highlight is this. This contract can be, once it's done, can be done as an electronic version, a fillable PDF. I want to demonstrate to you how a fillable PDF could look like. I just want to share with you. It's not done yet, but I want to share with you how a fillable PDF document could look like by showing you another contract which was reason, relatively recently drafted and published, this time in New Zealand. What is this contract? Remember, we're talking about domestic subcontracts here, but I just want to show you how that domestic subcontract could be made into a fillable PDF using another document, which uh, myself and a couple of my um, um, students, uh, and basically out of an assignment which I set at the university, uh, David Finney and uh, Nico Lambert, they did such a brilliant job that after they passed the exam with uh, A pluses and so on, um, they said, hey, look, why don't we, you know, check it out with the New Zealand Institute of Quantity Surveyors. Maybe they might want to publish it. To cut a long story short, this was finally published by the New Zealand Institute of Quantity Surveyors. It is a contract for consultancy services, QS consultancy services. Okay. It was published in November 2018. And this is the first consultancy contract, QS consultancy contract in the world to get the Plain Language Commission accreditation by the Plain Language Commission UK. This is the first consultancy contract. It's a plain language document. I know today we're not talking about consultancy contract. I'm just going to try to demonstrate to you a fillable PDF. And I'm going to mention this that, by the way, this is an amazing document because it's certified as a clear English standard document by the Plain Language Commission UK. Okay, right. And uh, there you go. This is the uh, team that drafted it. Of course, uh, uh, I was heavily involved in this. And David Finney is the chap I mentioned, and Nico Lambert. They're, they're, they're really good QSs. Um, Nico Lambert is working in industry. David Finney is, uh, is lecturing in Otago Polytechnic, but he has also been doing work for industry and so on. And it was very fine. And feedback was obtained from various other people, including uh, the likes of Peter Diggerholm, who is a well-known uh, uh, QS in, uh, in, in New Zealand, who was instrumental in dealing with all the... Uh, the, the uh, uh, adjudication, construction contracts act in New Zealand, all that. Paul O'Brien, who is uh, um, uh, active in the New Zealand Zero Quantity Space, as well as Society of Construction Law. Paul Bunkel, who is uh, again active in the New Zealand Zero Quantity Space, and three lawyers. We had three lawyers as well, Ari, Brendan, and Sonia, who, who reviewed the documents. And guess what? They said it's all fine, it's all good. So they endorsed it as well, meaning that although it's in plain English, you know, without the legalese, they thought it was fine. And this is how a fillable PDF could look like. So project name, uh, project sign, you just type, and so on, okay? Um, and the client's name, you just type it all up and type there. And there you go, this is what I would say is a fillable PDF, okay? Um, scope of services, so you can type yourself, okay? Or what you can do is, if you want, 
in the appendices to this, there is a example of scope of services. This is just an example. And he says, remove this page once you've decided. So you decide what scope of services you want. Maybe, um, okay, only that, right? Okay, so that's the scope of services. So, so what you do is, you, you just grab that, copy, and where is it? Okay, yep, scope of services. There you go, that's the scope of services. And then once you're done, print it out. It's a fillable PDF, it's a printed document. There you go, it's nice and beautifully printed and so on. And if you've got any other documents that you want, you can enter in a date for starting the word, okay? A date for completing the uh, services. How much is it? Oh, why isn't it typing? I tell you why, because I'm typing words. No, 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 no. Ah, it's gotta be numbers, can't be words. Can you see? So it's gotta be numbers. So that's the price, you know, QS fees. Okay, and what's the level of insurance? See, the minute you, you key in some other thing, okay, it immediately puts all the commas in the right places. Okay, this is obviously a very, very, very uh, big project with $64 billion QS fee or whatever. But it doesn't matter, I'm just demonstrating to you anyway. Okay, and then the minimum level of um, uh, insurances and so on. Okay, so there you go. When you type in the next one, the commas come into play, and there you go, fill in the blanks, and you're ready to go. And sign the documents. You, of course, uh, in the digital era now, you can. Um, uh, oh, actually, that's not me. That's uh, my wife's name. Never mind. Uh, so you can put a signature. I've just put my signature in. You know, using the feature. I'll put a name. Uh, oops. Um, where are we? Okay. Yeah. Na the name is there, and the date is there. Okay. There you go. Fill in the blanks, and the terms are. I'm not going to talk about the terms. We're not talking about consultancy contract. Maybe one day we can have a, another session. If you're interested, ask L2 series, Yong Hong Kit and Lam Wai Lun, um, or the tech moderator. It would be nice to have a session only on consultancy contract. Okay, a generic one which can be used anywhere in the world. I know that there's been interest from Indonesia and a few other countries, uh, including Malaysia. The Royal Institution of Surveyors Malaysia are keen to have a, a plain language version of a QS consultancy contract in South Africa from one of uh, my friends there who seem to think might be a good idea. Uh, now, if you look at it, again, the wording is all nice and clear and easy. Look at that, client's obligation. The client must pay the QS and so on, okay? And there you go, that's the terms of the contract. And yep, that's the services. Uh, and oh, and the fees, okay? Uh, whatever the fees are. Okay, and the notes relating to it, the hourly rates, uh, disbursements, and so on. Okay, end of uh, digression. I just wanted to demonstrate the potential of that contract, which can be uh, done as a fillable PDF, which we can all, um, you know, use it from there. Now, before I move, I just want to say one more thing, because we're looking at the future. Now, there is this thing called a smart contract. This contract is written, is written in such a way that it's a Word document. It can be a fillable PDF. The next stage is for it to be developed, coded into a computer so that it can be, uh, become a smart contract. Now, what is a smart contract? It's basically a computer coding where the contract administration, a lot of the features can be done by the machine, by the computer, generally, automatically, without human intervention. Okay, I repeat that, uh, without human intervention. Okay, so that is something which can be developed. Now, because this contract is written in uh, plain language, uh, it is relatively easy for anyone doing the coding into a computer to read the sentence and code it. Okay, for instance, if the coding requires you to key in other program and so on, it's easy. Uh, the coder will say, the contractor must submit the program by the 30th of uh, every month or updated program by 30th. So what is it? Who? The contractor. Uh, sorry, the subcontractor. Yeah, Must, which means mandatory, submit the program. A program is an identified document uh, to the main contractor, Okay, to whom? By the 30th of every month, the date is there. So um, there you go. It's, it's, it's there. Okay, uh, Very easily done. Now, um, whereas 
if you look at some of the nasty clauses from some of the contracts around the world, and I can talk about this till the cows come home using a PowerPoint slide, and I don't want to do that because I want to focus on completing this contract, how you use it, and it is this. 100 word sentences, 150 word sentences in one sentence. How are you going to code that? It's going to be very difficult. So this contract has got potential of being developed into a smart contract, coded into a computer as a smart contract much easily and more effectively than some of the traditionally drafted contract. And I'm sorry to say, uh, even the PAM 2018 contract or the JCAR contract and all that. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not in plain English, okay? It's not in plain language. So this contract is. By the way, the model terms 2007, which you've all been able to download yourself, um, is uh, also written in Bahasa Malaysia, in Malay language. Uh, so I suppose people from Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, and Brunei, and possibly some people in South Africa might understand that as well, because there are some Malay uh, people in South Africa in certain parts of, I'm not sure where, maybe Cape Town or somewhere. Um, so they might be able to understand the Malay version, but otherwise, don't worry about it, we've got an English version. If anyone is interested anywhere in the world to develop this contract, subcontract as a basis to suit your jurisdiction. Maybe you might feel, mm, I don't want to stand at one. I want to modify slightly. You know, I want to state what the currency is. I don't want it to be a generic one. Sure. Give me a shout. I'm happy to work with you. Okay. Now, before I continue to the rest, uh, with the rest of it, I just want, I've, I see there's a couple of questions and I, I want to deal with it. Um, Okay, there is one uh, person who is uh, logging in from, I think, it's uh, IIT in India. IIT is a well-regarded one of the top universities in, in India. Uh, really, really top university and probably by world standards as well. He's doing a bit of research and he would like you to participate. So, um, yeah, so if you want to share, uh, Abhishek, you can just use the uh, Zoom chat function, uh, write it to... Um, uh, anyone and uh, people can download it and do the survey after this okay not now pay attention you can do it after this session is over okay it'll take about 10 to 15 minutes of your time but not now please okay now i've also had one more question um ah from chia okay chia she's asking me could i share this consultancy service contract with us okay now this one is not in the public domain you have to be a member of nzitqs to get it but let me check with Marilyn, the executive director of NZIQS. I'm sure she wouldn't mind me sharing with the whole world, or at least the, those of you who are, who are registered for this. So I'm sure she wouldn't mind. I will ask permission from her, and then I will share it. Um, of course, I've got my own copy, which I can share, but I think out of courtesy at least, I think I should ask her, and I'll tell her, look, this was um, at, a, at a seminar, and people seem to be interested. Hey, look, why not share it? Sure. So uh, remind me if I don't, uh, Ms. Chia, and uh, I, will, I will certainly share. And then the organizers can share it to everyone who, who, who is doing this. And then, as I said, if you want a separate session purely on consultancy contracts, I'm happy to share it as well. Okay, right. Okay, let's um, move on. So there you go. Price for the works, fill in. Date for starting the works, just type in whatever date it is, okay? And, um, uh, oops, sorry, not that one. Uh, it's that one, okay? Now, uh, what you might see is, I have put in a font which is slightly different, um, and it's actually uh, Lucida handwriting, just so that when you fill in, uh, you're typing in, it looks a little bit different. But anyway, look, I don't care, it doesn't matter, okay? It doesn't matter what it is, it's just a, that's just a formatting thing. Um, at some point, before we finalize this and somebody publishes it, maybe I should ask you people, the audience here, uh, you know, do you like it like a stylish handwriting or do you like it in Arial as well? Maybe, I know. Um, I I'll do a quick poll just to make sure that you're all awake, just to test the polls, right? I am going to ask you um, with a poll, um, which will basically say, uh, the question will be agree or disagree, okay? Right, so this font here, the general font is in Arial Narrow, that's fine. But when the fonts are to be filled in, do you like this fancy like handwriting style? Like for instance, right, 
So let me just correct that. Oops. Um, there you go. Okay, 20th of June. Do you like this font? So um, the font should be in stylish font like Lucida handwriting. So I'm gonna launch a poll and you can put agree or disagree or maybe I don't know, I don't care, right? So try and be decisive. Uh, the statement is the font for those that blanks that you fill in uh, should be in different font style. Agree or disagree? Agree or disagree? Okay, come on. All you have to do is just agree or disagree. Should it be a different font style or the same font style? Oh, we've got quite a few agreeing. Come on, I can see the results. Hurry up, hurry up, quick. We've got 52% responded. Good, brilliant. 54%. Uh, let's get it up to 80% responded. So, you know, once 80% is hit, then I'll move on. Come on, hurry up. It's, um, we're getting on with time. Decide. Do you like, uh, you know, do you agree that the font where you fill in the blanks should be differentiated, you know, like the handwriting style, or should it be just uh, the same as the rest of the document? Okay, I'm going to finish it now. I'm going to end the poll and I'm going to share the results. I assume that you can see the results, but it might not appear in the YouTube video that eventually comes up because I'm not sharing the poll results, although I could, but I don't waste time. So basically you can see that 79% agree that the font should be slightly different, 15% uh, disagree. So there you go, that's useful. And 6% and, uh, uh, don't know. Okay, fine, let's move on. Look, I'm just testing it out because I want this to be interactive as possible. Uh, and at the end of this part A, I will pause for a while. I'll ask for feedback if you've got any feedback, questions, and so on. And let me just quick have a quick look at the chat function. Hmm. Okay, I've also got one more uh, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, precedence of the contract document priority you mentioned. Let me just deal with that question as well. I might as well just finish. Uh, Deal with it, did it? Thank you. As long as the font is different for easy identification, yeah, good, makes sense, uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Uh, Chung. Yeah, if you differentiate, it's easier for identification. If you have a different color, even it'd be nicer. So, I don't know why some of you think the font should be the same. Anyway, I want to address the question that was asked earlier. These documents, okay, the suggestion is. It will be better if you have a priority of documents in case there's a conflict amongst these documents. Good point. I will give it due consideration. It was decided as, as a matter of policy in the earlier 2007 published standard form that, no, we'll leave it to common law definition. Example, written words prevail over printed conditions and so on. So common law will prevail or as to which uh, documents will be priority over the other. But in some contracts, you actually say, in descending order of priority. So if you, if you put that in descending order of priority, some words to that effect, um, then uh, if there's any conflict, that will prevail over that, and the BQ will prevail over drawings, and the drawings will prevail over specification and so on. So you could have that. I take note, and I'll give you, well, when we come up with a final version, we will consider it very seriously, and um, yep, so thanks for that question. Uh, oh, I see another chat function. What is this? It seems like we mostly agree on the first poll, possibly because nobody likes monotony of any form. Okay, yep, yep. Okay, because uh, it, it'll be nice to break the, the, um, the, the, you know, when you fill in the blanks, for instance, okay? Like this one, for instance, again, is in font, which is a bit different, which is nice, you know? And if it's in blue color or red, even nicer. So you see all the variables. So what is this defects loyalty period? Okay, there you go. Oh, not 440 weeks, maybe, uh, I don't know, 52 weeks, okay? So that means one year from the practical completion date. There you go, it's flexible. And just in case you forget to fill in, there's a default. Of course, I put here 12 weeks. It doesn't have to be 12 weeks, it's a default. So uh, you, the reason for the default is just in case somebody forgot to fill in. So at least there's a default, okay? Right, that's, that's that. Um, now, what is this? Compensation for delay. Is that what some people call liquidity damage? Mm. Yes, it is. Can I just clarify this? I know I mentioned this at the session last week, but that was a purely a Malaysian audience, and this one is an international audience. So let me, let me deal with this very quickly. 
if in the main contract, the contract sum is 500 million, the liquid dam damage is, I'll exaggerate, right? 1 million per day in the main contract. And if in the subcontract, assuming the subcontract is a critical activity, the contract sum might be only 2 million, let's say, okay? Out of the $500 million job, it's a subcontract for 2 million. It's for the cauldron for the Olympic Games in, in, in um, where? In Papua New Guinea, okay? Uh, and uh, it's a very last activity. It will take one month to install the cauldron. And uh, for every day the project is late, the main contractor will have to pay to the client one million um, Papua New Guinean currency uh, per day, okay? Because it's a big project. Now, in the subcontract for the cauldron, if the cauldron subcontractor is late by one day, how much will the main contractor suffer? One million, right? So if the subcontractor who's on the critical path is going to be late by one day, the, the, the main contractor will have to compensate the client one million dollars per day. How much do you think the main contractor should recover from the cauldron subcontractor? I don't care what his um, or her uh, subcontract sum is. It's irrelevant. Why? Because the definition of a liquidity damage is not um, tied in to the subcontract sum at all. It is tied into what is a genuine pre-estimate of the likely loss. In this case, a genuine pre-estimate of the likely loss, given that this is the sole reason for the delay and the sole activity which has caused the delay, in this case, it would be 1 million. It could be a bit more. 1 million plus a bit of the main contractor's time to coordinate and so on. So it could be 1, point, uh, 1 million and 20,000 or something like that, right? So that is the amount that the main contractor should be able to recover from the domestic subcontractor for a delay of one day. So per day, so much. Which is why you don't want to put liquidity damage clause in your subcontract. It's better to leave it as a opposite of liquidity damage, meaning general damages clause or unliquidity damage clause. Okay, that is better. Okay, now here, instead of calling it general damages or um, unliquidated damage, the clause just says compensation for delay. And what is it? A reasonable compensation amount for financial loss and expense incurred by the contractor ascertained by the contract administrator or established or worked out or, or quantified. Maybe instead of ascertained, maybe we should use quantified. I'm just going to type that in. Quantified, okay. Um, yeah, why not? So ascertained by the contract administrator. So if, for instance, there are 10 subcontractors, all of them were contributorily liable to the main contractor. And maybe subcontractor A was 10% liable, subcontractor B was 1%, subcontractor C was uh, maybe 25%. So you apportion that 1 million liquidity damage that the main contractor suffers, assuming all the subcontractors are the only cause of delay. If it's a main contractor, 40% of the cost, the remaining 60%, so uh, instead of 1 million, 600,000, a portion amongst these 10 contractors in proportionate to their contribution to the delay. Okay, so that's what you would do. You get compensation and the amount is reasonable compensation for financial loss and expense incurred by the contractor, uh, uh, quantified by the contract administrator. Now that is the best and the most sensible way of getting the compensation clause sorted out between the main contractor and subcontractor, not liquidity damage. Because you don't know that any one of the 10 subcontractors is going to cause or going to be the sole cause of the delay affecting the main contractor. It might not be. So you go and put 1 million. In the first place, some of the small subcontracts, they'll be saying, wow, 1 million, my subcontract sum is only $5,000 or ringgit, or pounds. And if your liquid damage is one million, so, oh yeah, but because the painting activity, I know it's a painting contract, it's only $5,000, but then uh, if you're late, my compensation to the client is one million, see, so I gotta put one million. You get all kinds of argument, people challenging what's the amount, reasonable amount, uh, reasonable compensation not exceeding, oh, forget about challenges, and oh, it's effectively a penalty clause, forget all that. Leave it as a general damages or liquid, unliquidated damage, or in this case, I've just called it reasonable compensation for financial loss and expense incurred by the contractor 
And who is to ascertain that? The contract administrator. Oh, I can imagine a question. What happens if the contract administrator ascertains the amount unfairly or is not correct or is, you know, you don't agree with it and so on? Well, if you don't, then the answer is you can always get this opened up, reviewed and revised by an adjudicator or an arbitrator or a mediator could come in and assist you and so on. Okay, so that's how you solve it. Okay, now let me just see. There might be one question. Let me just see if this is in. Uh, liquid damage may be quite different from compensation for delay. Absolutely. Liquid damage is completely different from um, compensation for delay or uh, unliquid damage or general. Yeah, liquid damage is defined in law as a genuine pre estimate of the likely loss. We do not want liquid damage clauses in a subcontract for the reasons I've just explained. Okay, right. Okay. So let's uh, carry on. Oh, by the way, by the way. Uh, I'm sorry, I did say that I was going to explain who might be the contract administrator. It, it could be anyone, really. And, uh, and I, and I, but I did say that the contract administrator in the main contracts could be engineer, architect, and so on. Who should be the contract administrator in this subcontract? Who is going to be making all kinds of decisions, including when is practical completion? How much is the uh, value of the work done? how much is a reasonable compensation for financial loss and expense, okay? And all that, wow. So who is going to be the contract administrator in this subcontract? The answer is, don't just say this subcontract is back to back to uh, FIDE or, or PAM or JCT or AS4000 or JBCC or NZS3910. No, 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 no. Don't just say it's back to back. It's eight o'clock. Because if you just say back to back, it means nothing. When you say back to back, it means whatever it is that they're under the main contract, you're supposed to, whoever it is, does the same thing. If you go and put back to back with, say, FIDIC or PAM or JCT, and the architect is supposed to ascertain the amount, and the architect is a contract administrator, the architect will say, hey, wait a minute, I've got nothing to do with this subcontract. It's nothing to do with me. This is a domestic subcontract. It's not a nominated subcontract. It is not a main contract. I've got nothing to do with it. So don't go and willy-nilly start putting in things like, oh, this is back-to-back -back with the, uh, whatever main contract that you're using. Don't do that. Okay? So um, what you have to do is you have to think who should be the contract administrator. In a main contract, the contract administrator may well be the architect, the engineer, or whoever it is that is engaged by the client. And that person has got Two hats, one as an agent of the client and the other as an independent uh, person um, acting fairly between the client and the contractor. Two hats. I know it doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah. How can you get the architect, the engineer to be independent when they are the ones who had problems? Uh, the, the client is the one who engaged them and the client is the one who has got future projects. Will they still be independent, impartial and so on? The answer is that is in theory. And the practice of it is that is the assumption. I'm sorry, that's how we're going to go. Okay, that's the way it is. Okay, now um, in the same way, in this subcontract, you have to name someone. And normally, I would suggest that someone would be somebody from the contractor's organization. Maybe the contract manager. It could be the um, I don't know, the project manager or whatever. Whoever it is that's going to be administering the subcontract. Could be the QS, could be the project manager, could be the construction manager, could be the senior project manager, could be a project director of, from, the, uh, from the main contractor's organization, or it could be a uh, contract manager or contract administrator, whatever it is. Okay, so that's fine. Remember, their role is still exactly like the back-to-back -back in the main contract. They have to be acting in the best interest of the contractor when it comes to agency functions, but when it comes to independent functions like certification, deciding on practical completion and so on, they have to be impartial, look at what the situation is and fairly uh, decide between the subcontractor and the main contractor. Okay, right. Oh, okay, there's one more question from Ms. Chia. Is the, putting the phrase like compensation for delay better than liquid, liquid, liquid damage? I've just explained, I'm not sure what, Yeah, this when this question was asked, the answer is, Personally, if you put a liquid damage, you can, but I've just explained. What amount are you going to put for that cauldron subcontractor? One million? 
or are you going to put one thousand dollars meanwhile as a main contractor you're compensating the client one million per day are you okay with that you can we can do that fine okay so i'm saying well don't put liquid damage because you've got 50 different subcontractors you put one million each of them if you don't if you put a thousand on one of them and they happen to be a critical activity and then you've lost one million you can only recover a thousand dollars from them well it's up to you it's entirely up to you i would rather put it as actual actual compensation based on actual amount okay financial loss and expense incurred or whatever or financial compensation or you can put the word damages if you want or unliquidated damages or general damages whatever you suffer you prove to the subcontractor and you recover from them example i've just paid the client one million per day mr subcontractor you're the sole reason for the delay i'm going to recover one million dollars from you per day something okay so that's a legal implication uh and and that's how you would prove in court right yeah okay right let's carry on uh now insurance amount and so on to cover existing the way this has been drafted existing property so if you're doing renovation work on an existing property well there you go you can cover that as well okay and of, obviously often you won't be looking at that you'll just be doing insurance for a new one or whatever then you, you if you don't state anything at all the amount is nil okay now there's a reason i i've kept it all you know they, they call it what a watts and all everything is there a12 is not used why is it not used the reason is because when I, when I drafted this, I wanted to make sure that everybody is happy with the whole thing. Once everybody's happy, then I will renumber them and start looking at the, making sure that every clause in the rest of the contract is all perfect. Then I'll renumber. For now, because I originally had a, a, a provision there, I don't want to start changing it yet. The final version I can change. For now, I've just used not used for purposes of um, my monitoring okay um even advance payment so you can have an advance payment in this subcontract that's how flexible it is and if not stated the amount is nil there you go so don't worry about it you can leave this clause and you can just track it out or put nil if you don't want advance payment time for payment you must pay within how many days you know maybe 30 days oops, oops sorry not that um okay yeah 30 days for instance okay um and you just fill in whatever it is and if it's not stated there is a default for every contract you know or, or jurisdiction you can decide what the default is value of um, materials on site to be to be included you know you just put a percentage you know is it 100 percent or 75 percent 50 or whatever if not stated the default is that now person who nominates um an arbitrator so you can always uh, Put the AIAC if you're in, in Malaysia, uh, you know, or, or normally you would put uh, an authorized representative from AIAC, for instance. Don't put director. I know in Malaysia everybody uses director of AIAC. Don't put that. Put authorized representative of AIAC. Why? Because the director might be overseas. And if the director is overseas, how is the nomination going to be done? In Malaysia right now, we have no director of AIAC. So everything is suspended. Your contract, you have to get an arbitrator, you have to get an adjudicator, but there is no director. We don't want that. So if you just put authorized person from AIAC, and if you can have AIAC having a provision where it's a director or anyone else authorized, you know, deputy director, secretary, or whatever it is, various people that they may have in the system. So at least it can work. I've just put here for your information, if not uh, stated, authorized representative of arbitrated made a sincere New Zealand, and because I'm looking at it in New Zealand contract. I've just, I've just drafted this as in the context of New Zealand. Okay, uh, and uh, finally, uh, I'm sorry, not finally, A17 says, law governing this contract. You can have a default, or you can just type in um, whatever country, you know, New Zealand law or Papua New Guinea law or, or South African law, or whatever. But if for some reason, you don't state anything at all, then fine, you're okay. It is the law where the project is. So if the project is in Brunei, Brunei law applies. That's it. So do you see how generic it is? Okay. And then, of course, you'd still need to sign and so on. There you go.
Oh, someone is saying uh, the audio is no longer audible. I need somebody to tell me that um, the audio is okay. Can you hear me? Somebody needs to say yes, at least a tech moderator, or somebody needs to say yes whilst I have a sip. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, loud and clear, Dr. Nassim. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. okay. Um, I wish I had asked the question, are you enjoying this session? You know, uh, then that would be, oh, look, everybody's saying yes. Oh, oh okay, okay. I assume uh, that yes refers to you can hear me. Oh, oh, okay, some of you are enjoying. Oh, very much. Thank you, thank you. Um, sometimes you don't know what's going on in the background, whether you might be busy cooking, you know, instead of um, listening to me. Whatever, depending on what time of the day it is. Okay, right, let's carry on. So, signature. Forget about um, typing uh, things like, on the date first here unto set force, forget it. Look, contractor signature, name, driver's license. In New Zealand, we normally we say passport number or whatever. Of course, if you're in Malaysia, you might say identity card number, IC number, organization, witness. That's it. That's part A. <sighs> Maybe I should do a quick poll, a very, very quick poll, right? So far, that is the only blanks you need to fill in. Okay, uh, I want you to tell me, is it easy so far? We're not talking about the terms of the contract. Just this is how you would fill in the blanks for this whole subcontract. Is it easy or not? I've launched a poll. Is it easy to fill in the blanks or not? Or are you struggling to know, what do I fill in? I'm not sure, whatever. I want to know, is it easy or um, hard to, 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 you know, is it easy? Basically, that's the question. Yes or no? And this will be interesting because I, I'm, you know, uh, the, this target of this contract is that it is um, very easy to administer. So far, we've run through the whole of section A. I want to know whether it's easy, easy or um, hard to, to, to sort of fill in the blanks and administer the contract. Any more? Anyone else responding? No? Uh, I'm going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Ending the poll. And I'll share the results with you. So 92% say, yeah, it is easy. Nobody is saying no. And 8% are saying don't know. Okay, that's fine. That's okay. Right? Good. So that's, that's the um, end of that. Uh, look, it's good to have polls once in a while uh, because my teaching and learning consultants in Massey University say, oh, Nassim, you can't talk for a whole hour. You know, people will fall asleep. Uh, maybe I should do one more poll. Uh, have you fallen asleep? Uh, you know, yes or no, or whatever. No, it's all right. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, look, it's been an hour, uh, but you obviously haven't fallen asleep. Strictly speaking, I am in breach of what advice I have been given by teaching and learning consultants. They say 10 minutes, take a break, and go and have coffee, tea, have a drink, do some uh, activities, and so on. Do you want to do activities, or do you want me to cover this? carry on and finish off this contract. Because, you know, I need to make sure that you're paying attention, see? So look, uh, whether you are a, a, a class of undergraduates or postgraduates or, or industry or whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm just gonna carry on the way I normally do because obviously you people are engaged. Okay, right, let's move on. Part B, remember there are only seven clauses. This is the first of it, okay? Let's run through it. Let's go through every clause so that at the end of this, you should be able to use this contract literally without making any changes uh, when it comes out as a formal document and uh, get on with it. And what I would appreciate is your questions. Like for instance, can this be used on a $50 million subcontract? Okay, yeah, there you go. So you're saying carry on, brilliant. I'm gonna keep this recording because um, then I can prove to my, my university teaching and learning experts that the audience want me to keep going. Although I've been speaking for one hour and seven minutes, non-stop, well, pretty much. We had a few polls and all that, which is good, okay? Good stuff, let's carry on. Right, so the contractor, contract administrator and subcontractor must comply with all the obligations according to express provisions in this contract, which means all those written words, that's what it means, and those that may be implied in law. Right, now, question, implied terms I don't even have to mention in this contract. So basically, I can even delete that, okay? I can, if you want, delete those words. 
because what are implied terms? Implied terms are those that are not stated in this contract. So why do I have to say you have to comply with implied terms? It's meaningless. Let me explain to you why I've got those words. If I didn't have those words, we'll all assume according to express term provisions in the contract. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, but in law, there is, a, you know, in law, there could be terms which are implied in law. So this is just a reminder to you that, hey, look, yes, you have to comply with all the express terms, but hey, there are also implied terms in law, okay, that you need to comply with. So that's just a reminder. I personally think it's worth doing this reminder. I could do a poll again, you know, just to see what do you guys think? What do you girls think? Uh, what do you women think? What do you men think? Um, should I include that as a reminder that there could be implied terms or not? Okay, so it's worth asking the question, should, um, for example, it would be implied in, uh, under this uh, subcontract, if this were to be used in, say, New Zealand, then the parties can refer a dispute to adjudication, any kind of dispute, dispute on quality, dispute on money, dispute on completion, dispute on extension of time, any of it, it'll be implied. It's implied through statute under the Construction Contracts Act 2002, amended 2015, the New Zealand version. In Malaysia, it would be implied that if there's any dispute relating to payment, and only payment, that the party can refer to adjudication, but not if it is dispute relating to non-payment issues. That's in Malaysia. So that's the reason for me to remind people, hey, don't ask me to remind all the 1,001 potentially implied clause. I can't. It's 8.15. Okay. Um, so, okay, there are a couple of questions relating to this. Let me, how are the payment terms? Are they conditional? Direct payment from, okay, I'll come to that in a minute. Any obligation to remind implied or, uh, although they are covered in acts already? Yeah, it is, no, no, you don't have to remind them. I'm only doing that as a reminder. Another example. If there's a contract between a main contractor and a subcontractor, it would be implied that the main contractor won't hinder the subcontractor from doing their work. Okay? So you won't prevent them. You know, so if, if you, for instance, you won't stop them from getting access to the site, for instance. Okay? So they'll all be implied. Okay? So that's the purpose of it. Right. Um, okay. Uh, we'll, we'll come to payment terms in a minute, Shamim. Uh, uh, but for now, can I just say that payment terms are not conditional. In other words, because in 14 jurisdictions around the world, pay when paid and pay if paid uh, clauses are all outlawed in, in 14 jurisdictions, uh, including the eight states and territories in Australia, in New Zealand, in Singapore, in Malaysia, in the UK, in Isle of Man, and so on. So it, it's better to, to, to not have a pay when paid clause. If in your jurisdiction, you can still have pay when paid clause, go ahead and do it. You can put it in the preliminary section of the bills of quantities that's part of the contract. Go ahead and put it there. But in most jurisdictions, well, not most, 14 jurisdictions, pay when paid and pay if paid clauses are not allowed. So I haven't provided for that. Okay, there you go. Uh, now let's, let's carry on. Okay, um, this thing about all parties must act in a spirit of mutual cooperation, do their best to avoid disputes, is one of those trendy things under the NEC. Uh, for contract, for instance, it is trendy to put all parties must act in a spirit of mutual cooperation, you know, so, okay, we'll put it in, you know, why not? Okay, so let's all uh, be friends with each other and uh, uh, manage the contract and comply with the contract in a very friendly way so that at the end of the day, when the project is all completed, we can all have a campfire, sit around the campfire, hold hands and sing Kumbaya, okay, like how Boy Scouts do and Girl Guides. Okay. Mm, okay, it's interesting. Someone is saying that in the Middle East, back to back is still widely used. Okay, can I just clarify this? Okay, now uh, about back to back. Back to back can be the whole contract is back to back, or it could be relating to payment. I get the impression that payment, back to back payment in the Middle East is uh, widely used because there is no law perhaps banning that. Okay. So in other words, the main contractor doesn't have to pay uh, the subcontractor 
uh, until the client has paid the main contractor, for instance, okay? Now, can I just share one thing? Distinguish very quickly the difference between pay when paid and pay if paid. Pay when paid clauses uh, basically uh, is saying that uh, I, uh, Mr. Main Contractor, uh, will pay you, subcontractor, uh, when I am paid. So it's only a question of timing. In this subcontract, for instance, the subcontractor might have a clause in this subcontract um, uh, and their sub subcontract with a subcontractor. They will only be paid after they've been paid, for instance. So in this case, a main contractor might say, I will pay you when I get paid. Now that clause basically only refers to the timing of it. So they will pay in terms of timing, you know, as soon as I get the payment, I'll pay you, okay? Pay if paid is different. Pay if paid, however, suggests that the contractor will only pay the subcontractor or is only liable, there's no liability at all to pay um, if the main contractor doesn't get paid, okay? Right. Right, uh, uh, right. I completely agree with uh, uh, Keith, uh, who, who is saying, if only rely on express provision, then no matter how long the list, you're bound to omit a vital provision. Why take the risk? Um, that's right, yeah, yeah, correct. So, so don't go and uh, start specifying what are the implied terms. No, 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 just the express terms are express terms, you know, whatever is stated here, and the implied terms are whatever would be implied in law, okay? Um, let me give you, so it could be implied by case law, it could be implied by uh, statute, or potentially it could even be implied through customs and trade, for instance. Not anymore, but in those days, um, uh, in England, uh, if, if you went to a baker, uh, for instance, uh, and you, uh, you know, you ordered a dozen bread, you, uh, you will get 13, not 12, okay? Um, but in the construction industry, there's no such thing. So if you order a dozen bricks, you will get 12 bricks you won't get 13. And if you insist that you want 13 bricks, you'll probably get the 13th brick thrown at your face. So don't bother. There's no uh, implied term in, through trade and custom that um, a dozen means 13 in the construction industry. Okay, the contractor's general obligations. Let's quickly look through this. Generally, we give timely access to the relevant part of the project site. Not the whole thing, but relevant part. Uh, provide relevant information in a timely manner. Yep, okay, yep. Uh, pay the subcontractor based on the terms of the contract. Yep. Uh, name a contract administrator and a replacement because sometimes contract administrators might leave the country or they might die or, or whatever, okay? Uh, and comply with all relevant laws, okay? Including statutory obligations, that's it, okay? And the subcontractor must complete the work by the date for completion using competent personnel, uh, complete based on all provisions, including provisions on time and quality, cooperate with others and uh, don't cause uh, anyone to suffer physical injury, damage to property, and any other damages. There you go, general obligation, okay, of the subcontractor. And what about the contract administrator? Must provide all relevant available information, okay? Make all decisions concerning whatever, except where stated differently in the contract. So if the contract says, for instance, uh, the client will decide whether to, uh, the, 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 the termination provision, for instance. So, uh, then, oh, sorry, it might say the contractor decides, then uh, it's only the contractor who can terminate, not the contract administrator. And then also says here, administer this contract in a timely manner and carry out certification functions impartially. There you go, certification functions impartially. Okay, and it also says when the contract administrator becomes functious official, you know, out of office, that phrase, okay. The authority ends automatically when the final payment statement is issued. There you go, it provides a close out. Even if you didn't have such a clause, it would probably be implied anyway. Okay. Um, okay. 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 Now, uh, before I, I move to the next part, because a convenient point, moving to the next part, I just want to deal with a question. Uh, which says, since the standard terms of subcontract is generic, when there are discrepancies between the main contract and subcontract, which will prevail? Since the term in a specific form of a contract, example, the main contract, architect's contract, or PAM contract, or whatever, and the standardized terms of subcontract may not have been synchronized. Okay, let me just clarify this. This is a standalone domestic subcontract. Domestic means 
it is not, the subcontractor was not selected by the client or contract administrator, which also means the documentation and the tender was done by the main contractor, not the client or the architect or under PAM contract or whatever. It wasn't. That being the case, it's entirely the contractor's prerogative to put whatever they want in the subcontract. So if you're doing a roofing subcontract, what do you do? You extract all the relevant roofing drawings. You might extract the quantities, if you want, with quantities, and put it in the subcontract. So there is no issue of conflict with the, with the main contract, PAM contract, and so on. Fine. If there is a conflict, what will prevail is what you say in this subcontract. Surely that has to be the case. In this subcontract, if you put the payment is 1.2 million, in the main contract, it includes a $500 million job, which should prevail. Answer, of course, this subcontract. Who administers this subcontract? In the main contract, is the architect. In the subcontract, is the contractor, right? The, the, the contract administrator. Which should prevail? Of course, this has to prevail. You can't have the architect administering this contract because the architect in the main contract will say, I'm sorry, this is a domestic subcontract. I don't even know it exists. It's none of my business. I'm not going to administer it. I'm not paid for it. So all the time, what, state, what is stated in this subcontract will prevail, no matter what you try to do back to back. Okay, next. In the main contract, the completion date is different. In this subcontract, the completion is different. So when you say it needs to be synchronized, this can completely be synchronized with the main contract. But you got to think, what is the scope? In the main contract, you do the whole thing, roof, piling, everything. But in this subcontract, you're only doing the roof. So it is not synchronized. Well, it is. But it's only the scope is roof, not the foundation. So remember, always, the subcontract must always prevail over whatever you say in the main contract. So think what you want to put in the subcontract, the price, the date, the program, the whatever it is, and this will prevail always. Because under the concept of privity to contract, the contract is between the main contractor and the subcontractor. Only the main contractor and the subcontractor can sue each other, not the client, because they're not privy to this contract. I hope that's crystal clear. Okay, right, let's move on. Now, so the contract administrator may issue instructions. Why would this contract administrator issue instructions? It could be because the architect or the engineer under the main contract might have issued instruction to vary the work. So here, the contractor, whoever is a contract administrator, will issue just maybe attaching the, the, the architect's or engineer's instruction from the main contract to say, oh, they're saying change the roof, so there you go. Okay, you issue the instruction. You can attach any kind of document. You can write, rewrite it yourself, or you can just attach the other uh, sort of back-to-back -back instructions from the main contract. Okay, so I hope you're clear. Now, but it says here, all contract administrators' instructions, vision certificates must be dated and made in writing. Do you see the style of writing? It can't get easier than this. All contract administrators' instructions, vision certificates must be dated and made in writing. And there's no monkey business. Monkey business where, uh, you know, only monkeys have oral instructions or oral communication. Ooh, 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 ooh. But here, any instruction, put it in writing. Done. Okay? Otherwise, it's not valid. Otherwise, don't comply with it. Oh, but the architect under the main contract has told me to do this. Tough. Don't do it. Only when you get a written instruction, you should do it. Because if you, do, if you do do it, and later on they deny, you've got no grounds. So don't do it. Okay? And the subcontractor must comply with all administration, uh, contract administrator's instructions within the time specified, and if not specified, in a timely manner. So in other words, if, say, the, the, the contract administrator says, oh, um, uh, demolish that wall, the instruction will say, uh, within five days, 10 days, 30 days, or whatever. Oh, demolish the whole 40-story building. Why? Because it was wrongly set out. Okay, uh, six months, <laughs> okay, three months, or whatever. So you can't just say, oh, well, you know, specified within three days or whatever. So it depends on uh, the, the nature or the scope of the works. All subcontractors' notices and claims must be in writing, dated, justified with full records. There you go. 
Isn't this common sense? Isn't this good sense? If you want to put in a claim and so on, justify it, date it, put it in writing, full records, and submit it in a timely manner. Okay? Don't go and submit it after the project's over. All instructions uh, must be in writing, copied to all relevant parties, and so on. Okay, variations. Contract administrator may issue variations to vary the work. Normally, this will happen either because the subcontractor and the main contractor, there's some work which is not properly done, which is nothing to do with the client, or it could be something to do with the main contract and then they have changed something and then the main contractor now, the contract administrator will instruct the subcontractor to vary the work. Okay, and if there's any financial effect, the contract administrator certifies the value. And of course, if, it is, uh, if the uh, instruction is given due to a breach by the subcontractor, the subcontractor must bear all loss and expense associated with it, including value of the works. There you go, clause number one. <clears throat> clause number two, it's about the time clause, access to site. Give the subcontractor access to the relevant areas of the site. Not all in one go, or it could be done progressively. Being practical, as a subcontractor, you might not get full access, so progressively, okay? And the subcontractor must start on the date stated in A6. Remember A6 is a date for starting the work, and must complete by the date stated in A7. That's it. Oh, or any adjusted date, <clears throat> because it could be extension of time and so on. Program, uh, the subcontractor must give the contract a work program showing a breakdown to be incorporated into the contractor's overall program. Yeah, of course, because your subcontract program needs to be incorporated in the main contractor program to be given to the client. Uh, and you must keep updated, keeping to the contractor's overall project program whenever there are significant changes and so on, and give a copy to the contract administrator. Okay. Progress, the normal thing, progress regularly and time in a, in a regular and timely manner. Uh, use uh, reasonable effort to prevent uh, and minimize the delay. That's basically a mitigation clause, right? And uh, what else? Uh, <clears throat> okay, now suspension. If your contract does not have a clause for you to suspend the works, you cannot suspend the works. Okay, you can't suspend the works. So it is very, very important if you want the right to suspend the works, you must have an express provision in the contract to suspend the works. Like here, the contract administrator may issue instructions to suspend work for any reason. If you're instructed, you must suspend the work. If the contractor doesn't pay the subcontractor the net amount you, the subcontractor may choose to suspend the work instead of terminating because it's a termination provision as well in this subcontract. So you can choose to suspend. So in other words, for non-payment, for non-payment, there is an express provision here in this contract for the subcontractor to suspend the works. You go. However, before doing so, the subcontractor must give a written notice for the breach of payment to be rectified. And that notice must say, dear Mr. Contractor, if you don't pay me, I am going to suspend due to you not paying me. So you must give a notice and warn them of the possibility of suspension. The reason for that is just to manage it. You don't want any, any subcontractor nilly willy just, oh, I didn't pay, I'm gonna suspend immediately. No, give warning first. And then if it's still not, uh, payment is not done. And it says here, if the contractor doesn't pay within seven days from the date the contractor receives the notice, the subcontractor may suspend. So you got a bit of a seven day float period. Okay, extension of time. Okay, before extension of time. Why is it that PAM, IEM, JKR, uh, JCT, uh, no, sorry, not JCT, um, most other construction contracts in the world use the word extension of time. Why is this contract not using the word extension of time? Why does it use the word adjusting the time? Okay, let me just see. All right, there you go. Adjustment of time certificate. Why does it call it extension of time certificate instead of adjustment of time certificate? Uh, the reason is this. Because if, say, in the contract between the main contractor and subcontractor, um, say, overall January to December is the overall project, the subcontractor is 1st June to 30, 30th of June. Okay? It may well be possible that in the uh, contract, uh, there was some additional work to be done. Uh, maybe uh, maybe three months extension from 1st of June, uh, 
July, August, so up to uh, June, July, August, up to 31st of August, three months extension. And then after that, there's a variation omission. A big chunk of the work is omitted back. So instead of extending to end of August, it might be extended to maybe uh, end of July. So you've already given three months extension. After that, you want to give a contraction of one month. What are you going to call that? If your contract only talks about extension of time, are you going to call that extension of time? Uh, but, oh, extension of time from 31st August to 31st of July. It's not logical. So I've just used the word adjustment of time. And uh, because I don't want to use extension and contraction. Forget it. I mean, that sounds like um, what happened exactly 21 years ago today. Today is the 20th of June, 2020, right? Uh, 21st of June, uh, 2020 is my eldest daughter's birthday. And um, of course, you know what happens the night before uh, contractions start happening and, and everything else, you know. So, um, yeah, fine. Anyways, and, and it was the longest day. This was in Malaysia. So it was the longest day uh, in the Northern Hemisphere and the shortest day in uh, tomorrow will be the shortest day in New Zealand and Australia and so on. So forget about using extension of time or uh, contraction of time and so on. Just call it adjustment of time. There you go. <clears throat> Brilliant. Now, just to share with you, I'm not the only one in the world using this word. Uh, and this was done completely independently. For your information, if you look at the most commonly used construction contract in the, in the UK, the JCT contracts, which is used in about 70% of projects in the UK, they too have in their contracts now called it not extension of time anymore. They call it adjustment of time. There you go. Great minds think alike. Down in New Zealand, which is literally poles apart from the UK, they thought it's sensible to change it from extension of time, EOT, EOT, to AOT. And I thought, uh, just going back a few years ago when I was in Dunedin, literally London and Dunedin are poles apart. If you were to poke a pole through London, the nearest city in the world would be Dunedin. It might not be exactly Dunedin, but if you go by the nearest city, it would be Dunedin. Poles apart, JCT thought, well, we'll call it adjustment of time. And I thought it's better to call it adjustment of time. I didn't look at what they were doing. They didn't look at what I was doing. Just coincidentally. Maybe great minds think alike. Although some say fools seldom differ. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So there you go, extension of time. If there's going to be any extension of time, the normal things. Notify, um, you know, give a notice. If you can't start, whenever there's any disruption, the contract administrator then must assess and decide if the date for completing the work is affected. Now, notice this clause. It's a very, very powerful clause. Observe this, please. Maybe I should make this bigger. I'm going to make this bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Maybe I should highlight it as well. This is a very powerful clause. Let's highlight this in yellow. The contract administrator once you've got the notice, must then assess and decide if the date for completing the work is affected. So short. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 17 words. The World Plain Language Commission and everybody in modern legal drafting suggests that the average words per sentence should be about 20. Some say 18, also some say under 25. Here's 17 words. Very powerful. Let me share with you. If there's any disruption to the work, the subcontractor gives notice. But the contract administrator will only give extension of time if the contract administrator decides that the date for completing the work is affected. Those words are extremely powerful. If the date for completing the work is affected. In other words, if the activity is not a critical activity, not on the critical path, is the date for completing the work likely to be affected? Answer, no. It'll just be a float activity. Let's say external works. It's being done, but it's not a critical activity. Uh, the building works might be critical activity, so it doesn't matter. So in this case, no, no extension. But if it is a critical activity, and if the contract administrator decides that the date for completing the work is affected, it doesn't matter if the progress is affected. The notice must still give, be given if there's any disruption to the subcontractor's progress of the work. Nevertheless, whether or not the subcontractor gets extension of time depends on whether the date for completing the work is affected, not automatically just because the progress is affected. Are we clear? 
it doesn't say that here, but that's the effect of understanding this contract, okay? And understanding concepts like critical path and so on. Now, what about the critical path program? Why doesn't it say here? Well, it does, okay? It says you must submit a program. And you, you show the breakdown and the timing of the work and so on. However, you don't go and put, you must do it in Primavera. You must do it in Microsoft Project or Artemis and so on. Why? Because not all subcontracts require the subcontract to be producing uh, the program or the subprogram or the subcontractor's program in a fancy software. Maybe not. Maybe yes. I don't know. This is a standard form. You want Primavera? You go and put it in the bills of quantities, in the preliminaries. Go ahead, do it. But don't go and put it here. So I hope it's clear why the standard form of contract does not necessarily uh, uh, state um, you know, that level of detail as what type of program and so on. Okay? I hope it's clear. Okay. And then it goes on to say the grounds upon which the, contract, the subcontractor might be entitled to extension of time. As long as the delay is not due to any breach by the subcontractor or anyone who that the subcontractor is responsible for, the contract administrator may adjust the date for completing work in an adjustment of time certificate. By the way, have you noticed? It doesn't say capital A, T, C. Okay? No. Don't worry about it if you're the contract administrator. Don't worry about, oh, but it's a defined term. I must put capital A, otherwise it's not a legally, um, effectively an adjustment of time certificate. Okay, so what are the grounds? The failure to act by the contractor, contract administrator, whatever we're going to control, exceptional bad natural environmental event, including exceptional bad weather. Government authority that would pick up COVID-19, for instance, in any of those countries. The contract subcontractor suspending the works, you get extension of time. And then, of course, uh, uh, one is suspending the works, following an instruction from the contract administrator, hey, look, suspend the works. Uh, whereas in, in uh, Roman 5, you'll be suspending following non-payment, okay? And then practical completion, uh, basically who decides? Contract administrator decides. Not happy with it, Mr. Subcontractor? You go to a dispute resolution process. In this contract, there's opportunities for negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. Adjudication depends on which jurisdiction. If your country or your jurisdiction has got adjudication as a pro provision, an act, fine, so be it. And practical completion is generally a common law definition uh, where work is substantially complete. And if there's any minor defective work, it won't cause major disruption. And then defects lie the period, you go and put it in. Okay, now I'm gonna share with you something about the defects lie the period uh, when we look at A9, okay? But I just wanna finish this and then we go back up to A9. The contract administrator may instruct the subcontractor to rectify all breaches and so on throughout the project, okay? Uh, issue instructions, do this, do that, or whatever. And then once everything over is over, there is a final completion certificate that will be issued. Now, remember, the final completion certificate effectively is, some people call it what? Certificate of making good defects. Come on. It's not just about making good defects, okay? It's a final completion certificate. Everything is complete. It's not just about defects. It's about everything. All obligations have been fulfilled, snagging list, the whole works, okay? Um, now, when do you actually issue uh, that? When all the defects have been rectified or end of the defect loyalty period, whichever is later. So at the end of the defect loyalty period, if the work defects haven't been rectified, then you don't issue it until the defects have been rectified, whichever is later. And finally, if the subcontractor doesn't complete the work by the date, uh, you issue a non-completion certificate. Uh, the subcontractor then uh, compensates the contractor for the, by paying, paying financial compensation for loss and expense incurred by the contractor. Okay? And the financial compensation is calculated from the day after the current comp contractual completion date until uh, practical completion. There you go. And you certify this in payment certificate. I'm, I'm trying to squeeze this into, believe it or not, the whole time clause is only in two pages. This is one page, and this is another page. But I've got two lines moving over. Don't worry, that's a formatting thing. Sure, we can squeeze something. We'll work it out. Or maybe adjust a clause, or maybe you know, some of this with one word, there you go, completion date. Maybe it can go a bit. Oh, this one, rectify. I'll I'll think about it. Don't worry about it. But you know, then this whole contract can be 
17 pages instead of 18 pages. Okay. Uh, now, I mentioned that I want to go back to A9, and I will go back to A9, which is basically the filling in the um, how many dates or whatever. Okay. So, what is a defect life period? Answer X number of weeks from the date of the contractor's practical completion date certified under the contract between the client and contractor. Wow. Okay, this is the number of weeks. If you're a piling works contractor, subcontractor, the weeks is from the contractor's practical and completion between the contract between the client and contractor. Why? Because if it is under the subcontract itself, if the project is five years, well, let's exaggerate. Okay, let's just say two years. Subcontract for piling works finished in January. Okay, uh, if it's one year, at the end of the one, uh, one year, it's over. No more defect liability period. Whereas the main contractor is still liable, right, to their client after, until after the two years. So this is where effectively you're making it back to back. But you're not just making back to back by saying, like in Malaysia, normally people might back to back lah. Well, it's according to the same contract. No, 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 no. You have to think and decide what you want, in what way you want it back to back, okay? Right. So there you go. You're thinking about that. Of course, you can modify this and say, no, 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 no. It's uh, 52 weeks from the, when the main, uh, the, the subcontract practical completion date is. You can do that as well. Okay. So you, 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 can, you can decide when. Okay. Now let's carry on. So non-completion is done. Let's now look at the payment clause. Payment clause is pretty straightforward, really. The total price for the work done is stated there. And if the price is not stated, you calculate based on the actual work done and using the rate stated in the contract. Because we already had, let's say you don't have the total price, no quantities, no bills of quantities, no measured lump sum. Then you use the schedule rates multiplied by the actual work done. Nice and easy. And if you don't even have rates, you don't have a schedule rates, then you use fair market rates. This is an incredibly flexible contract. It can be used as, as a subcontract for with quantities contract, pure lump sum contract, schedule of rates contract, with approximate quantities contract, which means the remeasurement contract, or even a um, just fair market rates contract. You know, there's no rates and so on. You just use it, okay? So this contract is extremely flexible. You can use it in any form or manner as a lump sum contract with quantities, with re approximate quantities or remeasurement contract, or Schedule rates contract, you can use any of those, okay? Insurance is fine, you just uh, provide for what it is that you want your amount and third party liability and so on. You can put it in the bills of quantities. Um, I mentioned about not used here, don't worry. Once the whole contract is done and a final standard form of contract is gonna be done, I'll check the numbering, make sure the referencing is all correct and I'll remove that. And this becomes clause 3.3 instead of 3.4. And there's even a provision for advance payment. Why not? You might have contracts which do have a advance payment provision. So if you have, you say it in A13. If you don't have, leave it blank because automatically the answer is nil. And you have payment claims based on work done, subcontract, term is submit a claim for, for claims and so on. Everything is valued by the contract administrator and issue a payment certificate within seven days of receiving a payment claim. And um, the contract will specify when the payment must be in the appendix under A14. That's it. Okay? There is, observe this, there is not even one multiple cross-referencing. Subject always to, subject always, none. It's only referring to A, where you fill in the blanks. Okay? And what are the items to be included? The various additions, cumulative value of work done. Ignore this. Okay? Uh, net value of varied works. Uh, variation works, basically. Unfixed materials on site. Uh, compensation for loss and expense, following a breach or suspension, uh, compensation uh, following valid termination. Okay? And so those are the additions. And what do you deduct? You deduct payments made for advance, uh, if any, deducted progressively in equal installments, cumulative of total number of uh, certificates expected. So if there's going to be 10 certificates, divide by 10 every month, what the amount is. Okay? Cumulative value of uh, previous, because always, uh, Payments on a cumulative basis. Uh, compensation for delay, okay, which we already discussed earlier. Uh, 
adjustment in the value of work completed following breach, uh, breaches. Okay, I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Okay, under quality clauses, it says here adjustment in the value of works completed following breaches that the contract administrator instructs are not to be rectified. In other words, there may be occasions when the subcontractor has been in breach and uh, the contract administrators, uh, sorry, con subcontractor has been in breach, contract administrator says, don't rectify that breach, leave it. So you just adjust the value of the works, okay? So if the stack is not brilliant, um, you know, or, or whatever, you know, maybe the whole building is out by one meter, but it's still okay. Uh, so there's maybe some value, loss of value in, because it doesn't have the brilliant feng shui from the original version because slightly angulated, uh, then you, don't demolish the whole building. <laughs> you just, what do you do? You adjust the value of the work completed uh, with a certain value to it, which you can always work out using the Feng Shui master or um, loss of use of maybe uh, five car parks because the whole building is eating up into the five car, five car parks. Whatever. And then of course, uh, financial loss and expense uh, incurred by them and so on. And the net amount due is basically a total addition minus the, um, uh, deductions okay uh, and within 30 days the contract administrator finalizes the accounts and issues a final payment certificate and it says here not later than some the contractor must pay the subcontractor the net amount stated or vice versa it may be possible that at the final account stage it is the subcontractor who must repay the main contractor certain works done Okay, because they've been basically over certification. Quality clause. The first part is basically saying subcontractor must complete based on all quality provisions. And uh, uh, if the subcontractor does workmanship design even, remember subcontractors do do design sometimes. Shop drawings, for instance, be warned. A subcontractor who does those design component, the obligation is fitness purpose, absolute guarantee, okay? So if you're a subcontractor and it's not your scope, don't undertake to design and say, I'm sorry, I'm not a designer, I can't do it, you give me the design. The main contractor can then go and get the design from the clients or the client's architects. And if there's any breach, the subcontractor, the, the contract administrator can instruct to rectify the breach. If the subcontractor doesn't rectify, the contract administrator can get others get others to rectify the breach and deduct from payment. Done. That's what normally contracts provide. But here's a beauty. Instruct the contract, the subcontractor, not to rectify the breach. Okay, don't rectify the breach. The contract administrator may then adjust the value of the work done, taking into account the effect of breach. Okay, basically, some contracts call it diminution in the value of the works. I don't like to call it diminution. In fact, based on actual experience for the construction court renovation in, I can't remember whether it was Shah Alam or Kuala Lumpur, uh, a similar contract was used. And uh, uh, this was a breach because the contractor used different type of lighting because the court people had told them, oh, we like this light, you know, it was used somewhere else and all that. And the contractor actually complied. They shouldn't have complied because you only comply with the contract administrator, the architect who was administering it. And then what happened was, um, well, technically that's a breach, but the value of the works were actually more because it's a better quality and so on. So look, don't value, you just uh, don't, 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 don't go and remove the brilliant lights and put a lousy light or whatever, just uh, adjust the value of the works, okay? And uh, health safety is just a general clause saying you must comply with it. This one here about subcontracting is basically reminding the subcontractor, look, don't total sub, don't totally sub the works without the uh, contract administrator's written consent, okay? Um, but wh whatever, whenever you subcontract, the subcontractor remains fully responsible for all the works, right? Um, and then uh, termination. Uh, termination is a normal provision, you know, if you don't pro proceed with the works regularly and diligently, you wholly suspend the works and so on. And termination is an important thing, which is why there are lots of procedures. You must give notice. And then if you don't rectify, then within seven days uh, of receiving the notice may terminate and not. Right? So that is termination by the termination of the subcontractor's employment by the contractor. 
there's also a possibility of termination of the subcontractor's employment by the subcontractor themselves, okay? And the reason for that is if the contractor does not pay subcontractor. So that's the only reason under which um, the subcontractor can choose to terminate the employment, okay? And the process is there, uh, compensation, direct for no loss and expense or whatever, and the procedures are uh, set. So following termination for any reason, right? Whether client terminate, uh, the main contractor, main contractor in turn terminate subcontractor, whatever, then you, um, uh, you know, the, the, the contract administrator issues instructions on all plant equipment, whether to be retained or whether to be uh, removed from site and so on, right? So all those are instructions uh, that the, um, um, uh, that, that, that needs to be done by the uh, uh, contract administrator and every party must abide by it. Why must every party abide by it? Because following the termination, what has been terminated? The subcontractor's employment. Okay? Subcontractor's employment. Not the co subcontract itself. Co subcontract is still there. But the employment has been ended. Employment has been terminated. So everybody... The main contractor, subcontractor must comply with the rules and follow, for, go on to site, remove this, then, yeah. Okay, now, sorry, I just uh, have seen there is one question. What about temporary works design? Is it still reasonable skill and care or fitness purpose? The answer is any design under this contract, as we saw just now, any design done by the subcontractor, the liability is expressly fitness purpose, done. We're not talking about implied terms. Expressly, the contract says every design done by a subcontractor is, it must be fit for its intended purpose. So it's absolute liability. Okay. Okay. Finally, clause seven, dispute resolution. And it just says here, as a reminder, this contract provides for disagreements between contracting parties to be resolved through negotiation, mediation, and arbitration. Question. Why do we call this disputes. Why don't we just say resolution of disputes or dispute resolution? Why does it say disagreement? Because in many cases in court or in arbitration and adjudication even, it has been argued by lawyers saying that, oh, a dispute hasn't crystallized and dispute needs to be crystallized as defined in law. And the parties are saying, oh, you can't come to arbitration. Why? Uh, because, you know, uh, I know you put in a claim, but it hasn't been completely rejected. Therefore, there's no dispute yet that you can bring to arbitration. Really? Forget that. I can you imagine? Obviously, someone hasn't paid and the subcontractor is not happy. And they're saying, oh, but a dispute hasn't crystallized. It's only a mere claim and then you didn't pay. No, so it's not really a dispute. Forget all that. I just say, as long as it's a disagreement, you can go to uh, arbitration, mediation, and negotiation to get it resolved. Done. Don't give lawyers an opportunity to start arguing about uh, the definition of dispute, whether there is a dispute or, uh, um, or, or, or not under the contract. Okay. I know I started dispute, but I've just seen there's a question. What is the difference between termination and determination in PAM? The answer is, uh, PAM, by the way, is, uh, is the most commonly used private sector contract in Malaysia. Oh, gosh, I really need to clear this. The differences in termination are terminating the contract itself, which means see you in court, I'm not going to compl comply with any instructions given by anybody. Or terminating the employment of the contractor, or in this case, subcontractor. That means, okay, Stop work, you don't have to do anymore. I'm going to end the contract, but you still have to follow the process because we still got a binding contract. So in other words, what has been terminated is the employment, not necessarily the contract. The choice of use of the word termination or determination is completely interchangeable. Okay? It's just that PAM uses the word determination. IEM contract used to use the word termination. Termination of the employment or termination of the contract. In PAM, it could be determination of the contractor's employment or it could be determination of the contract itself. Under 3910, under JCT, under the Hong Kong contract, under the Singapore contract, it matters not anywhere in the world. The word 
In fact, there are three words that you can use interchangeably. Termination, determination, and ending the contract. The NZIA contract, New Zealand Institute of Architects contract, used the word ending the contract, ending the contract, ending the contract. The JCT contract for, for minor, uh, I think it's renovation works or so, HBO5 or something, uses the word ending the contract, ending the, term, uh, the, the contractor's employment or whatever. It's ending, ending, ending. Termination, termination, termination. Determination, determination, determination. You can use any one of those interchangeably. But what you must distinguish is terminating or ending or determining the contractor's employment as opposed to terminating, ending or determining the contract, uh, the contract itself. So that is the difference. You can look around at all construction contracts around the world. That is the way uh, the whole structure is. Don't try to distinguish. The, personally, I prefer with termination terminating the contract or terminating the contractor's employment. Why? Because termination is four. Termination. Determination is five syllables. That's the first reason. Second, the word termination means ending the contract. Whereas the word determination, determination can mean, or determining can mean you're deciding something, you're ending something. I'm determined to finish this very soon. Okay? So it's got three meanings. That's bad drafting. Okay? So don't do that. Okay. Um, let's uh, carry on. And, and this contract encourages the parties to negotiate and uh, or opt for mediation and so on. If you can't think of any mediator, you can always go and um, get the part, person named in part A to recommend a mediator. Okay. Now, I don't want to go into the details of the arbitration agreement because the arbitration clause is very, very, uh, a very standard routine clause like you would find in any other contract. Typically, in Malaysia, for instance, arbitration can only be, they're all always final and binding, which is brilliant, okay, final and binding. And, but it says here, you can only go to arbitration uh, after, uh, uh, there you go, it may only be started and continued after a practical completion or obligation being completed and so on. So that's the way it is. But in New Zealand, I notice, uh, you know, there's no such restriction. You can go to arbitration any time. That's forces for courses. You decide what you want. And the rest of it is a normal thing where the arbitrator's uh, uh, award is final and binding and including the decisions on costs and so on. Right. Now, this is a, the beta version of a standard term of construction subcontract, which can be used anywhere in the world. That is the entire contract. And if you look at the number of words there at the bottom, 4,100 and, uh, sorry, 5,500 uh, words. That is extremely short going by any contract. Remember, this can be used back to back with any main contract. I just want to share with you one other little thing, if you, if you can give me a few more short minutes, because um, this is going to be really interesting and useful. And that is, where is it? Okay. I'm going to share with you. Oops. Right. I'm going to share with you a pro forma templates. Hmm. Okay, it's not showing that. Sorry. Okay, I'm going to share with you a new share. And where is it? Ah, okay. Look at this. This is called a pro forma template, adjustment of time certificate. Contract for current date for completion is this. Under clause, I now adjust. And the reasons are all already in a template. All you have to do is tick or put number of days for each one of those reasons, sign, and the subcontractor acknowledges. That's it. So I've got a series of a template, which I was sharing earlier. I'll new share again. Where is that? A range of templates. Okay, I'll just show you quickly. Uh, right, I don't think you can see that, but it doesn't matter. Adjustment of time certificate, practical completion, final completion, non completion, advanced payments, payment certificate, main contract certificates and clauses, and so on. Okay, so there you go. There is uh, an entire uh, a suite of contracts, enough for you to do and administer the whole contract. And um, you, you should be able to just uh, let me see, what am I sharing now? Mm, okay, I'm, I'm going to 
new share, where is that document? Okay, we're back to the contract. So this is the contract which can be universally used. I'm gonna just check on one or two chats here. Uh, Oh yeah, there's a question. Can we have the adjustment of time template as well? You can more than have adjustment of time template. You can have the um, adjustment of time payments template. You can have a non-completion template, practical completion template. Look, you have already registered for it. You will get the entire, okay, now. You will get, of course, um, you already can download, anyway, CIDB have put it up, uh, the model terms of 2007. Um, what I will do is, I'm happy to share with you this. Remember, I've been typing bits and pieces. I'll tidy this up and through the organizer, the organizers are always concerned about bombarding you with uh, uh, emails and all that. But if you want, okay, let me do a poll so that the organizers don't worry too much about how oh, they don't want to be bombarded, they get upset and so on. So the question is, the poll question is, uh, do you want... Um, uh, this uh, uh, beta testing and your templates to be emailed to you yes or no okay so that's the poll do you want these uh, pro forma templates to be emailed to you uh, because if you don't want uh, they won't bombard you okay otherwise you might say why are you spamming with this and the other so so look the organizers are well aware um honkid is a, a well-known claims consultant not many people know that uh, that he was the um, he got the highest score in the uh, the media the, the adjudication uh, examination in in conducted by the AIA series and okay? not many people know that but I'm just sharing with you okay right so far 100% of you are saying that uh, yes but come on yes do you want the templates or not okay I'm gonna end the poll now uh, in five four three two one zero okay and the poll and i'll share the poll okay 97 of you, percent of you want the template to be uh, emailed to you and it's only one person who says no but never mind we will we'll go by the uh, vast majority okay right folks i'm going to bring a, 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 a formal end to this however I'm going to carry on to take oral questions or written questions. But now is the time for you to take a snapshot of yourselves if you want that CPD or, your, sorry, not CPD, that certificate of attendance. So I'm going to stop talking for uh, maybe 60 seconds for you to take a snapshot of your, um, whatever it is, I think um, uh, tech moderator said, uh, do you want to give an instructions tech moderator? And then I'll take questions orally or I'll just hang on for anyone to uh, do the rest of the session. Okay, and what I'll do as well is I am going to do a poll, a satisfaction poll. Uh, simple question, do you like the session? Yes or no, okay? I'm gonna launch the poll as well, while at the same time. Okay, do you like the session? Yes or no, a simple yes or no, that's all. Whilst you also take a snapshot of yourselves. And then after this, I'm gonna take questions and it's nine o'clock in New Zealand right now, nine in the, in the evening, but look, um, I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm, had a whole day out, uh, pretty much whole day, um, and I'm happy to take questions. Anyone got any questions? I'm happy for it to be a free for all. Either um, orally, you unmute or put your hands or whatever, or you can type the questions. Go on. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope uh, you you really are confident enough. Okay, I, I'm just gonna just end the poll here, um, end the poll and uh, share the results. Okay, right, 100% of you uh, like this session. <laughs> I'll stop sharing now, so, which is good. Oh, maybe I should take a picture of that because uh, it's nice to know that all of you enjoyed the session.